Good morning, everybody. <laughs> well, it's a good thing I used to teach school. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt such a lively conversation. It seems like a good sign on day three of a conference. Um, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here this morning for the third day of a sold-out conference, um, which is a wonderful uh, sign for the future of peace building. Um, and for those of you who have not previously been to the United States Institute of Peace, it was founded in 1984 by Congress in response to citizens' demand for additional focus within the U.S. government on peace building and how to manage conflict. Uh, we are federally funded but independent, and we are dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, peace is practical, and it's essential for national and global security. And we do that by working in partners around the world in conflict zones, equipping them with tools, equipment, training, um, and policy recommendations. And it's wonderful to be here with a group of people who I know are completely aligned with the idea that peace is possible and peace is practical. And so many of you are doing that in ways here in this country and around the world every day. Um, and I can tell by looking at who, is, uh, who has been signed up for this that there is an incredibly diverse audience here, people coming from different backgrounds, different parts of the world. And so um, I know there's been a really rich conversation the last two days. Um, this is a great opportunity today to really explore the different ways that peace builders can make a difference in conflict areas and in fragile states. I just returned from Istanbul where we had the first uh, World Humanitarian Summit. And I was just sharing with Melanie that what was remarkable to me is how front and center the issues of violent conflict are in that conversation. Uh, both in terms of mustering the political will to manage those conflicts, but also in how the humanitarian and the development community has to understand conflict dynamics, has to think about how things are done in a way that enable uh, local actors to build peace from the ground up uh, as well as from the top down. And in the backdrop of what is going on globally, these issues have never been more urgent, and this conversation has never been more important. And with that, I am absolutely delighted uh, to introduce uh, a, a good friend, um, somebody you know well by now, uh, Melanie Greenberg, who has really spent a career thinking about these issues and doing remarkable work. And so please join me in welcoming Melanie. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of AFP's annual conference on next-gen peace. We are so proud and honored to co-host this day of the conference with the United States Institute of Peace, the only government organization dedicated solely to peace and an important partner and champion for all of civil society, working for a more peaceful and secure world. And so, Nancy, thank you for your brilliant leadership and your ability to link so many different sectors and communities together for more unified and effective voice for peace. And thanks, too, to Linwood Ham over in uh, this corner. We're so grateful to you and Tina and all of your USIP colleagues. We couldn't ask for, more, for a more wonderful partner, and it's really been such a joy to plan this with you. The theme of this conference is Next Gen Peace. Over the past two days, we've been exploring a fascinating terrain, ranging from innovation and peace building to storytelling, new frontiers in teams and human performance, peace building in Baltimore, and community mediation over, decade, over a decade in Nepal. We continue the theme of innovation today with deep dives into some of the most complex peace building problems facing the world today, highlighting new thinking and strategic approaches. We also shine a light onto the deep personal and societal costs of violence on a very personal and societal level, a reminder of why we're all spending our lives to build peace in an increasingly turbulent world. So I want to thank the AFP staff and all of our interns for making it such a joy to come into work every day and for the blood, sweat, and tears they've given for this conference. And I especially want to recognize Emily. Emily? Lucy. 
who has masterminded and led all of the planning for the conference and whose brilliance you see reflected in everything today. So thank you to all of you. I want to thank AFP's funders who've made this possible, and we look forward to a great day here today at USIP. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce Bob Berg, AFP's new board chair. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Nancy. It's so good to be with the USIP again and to gather on the last day of a, a three-day event. Uh, I used to chair the donor uh, committee on uh, evaluation at OECD, and uh, I think we need to do a quick evaluation in the last two days. So remember on TV and radio shows, they used to have an applause meter So for those of you who attended the last couple of days, what did you think of it? Oh, you're so right. Uh, <laughs> so for those of you who missed the event, see, you know, next year buy the whole package. Uh, by the way, our opening keynote uh, speaker, uh, retired uh, general and uh, administrator of uh, NASA and, and presidential cabinet member, um, Charlie Bolden wrote me last night saying, thanks for introducing me to the work of the Alliance. I look forward to future opportunities to participate and support your work. That's one of the nice things about these conferences. You can bring people in and have them come into the tent. Uh, I just want to note that uh, this year we have added reason to be together. You know, you never know when you've been in a golden age until after the age is over. That's those of us who were in the Carter administration kind of learned that. Uh, <clears throat> democracy, liberalism, human rights, the space for civil society in many countries, and violence are all trending in the wrong direction. Four of the five BRICS and the EU are in serious difficulties. We could be here a year from now with an American Berlusconi in power. Despite these trends and threats, the global community had its most productive year ever. That is because they found ways to work together on environment, on social and economic goals, and on the marvelous and serious goal for peace. We as a field have accomplished much in our work, and in this difficult environment, we not only must be smarter in our work, we must work in far greater, more effective, more embracing, and more courageous alliance. As the great British economist Barbara Ward said in the midst of the Cold War, we are either to be a community or we will die. So we have added serious purpose for being together today. I look forward very much to an exciting and needed set of discussions, and we will begin with a great first session and Melanie's going to introduce it. Thank you. So it is a tremendous honor to introduce Jeremy Richman, who will deliver the keynote address this morning. Jeremy is a neuroscientist and the founder and CEO of the Aviel Foundation. Dr. Richman has extensive ex research experience spanning the range from neuroscience and neuropsychopharmacology to cardiovascular biology, diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, immunology, and inflammation. He has worked in the research and drug arena for over two decades and is passionate about helping people live happier and healthier lives. Dr. Richman is dedicated to reaching out and educating youth and believes our future relies on their imaginations. This is manifest in his teaching martial arts, biology, neuroscience, and rock climbing to children and teens for more than 25 years. Most important, he believes it's critical to empower youth to advocate for themselves and their peers when it comes to brain health and brain illnesses. Toward this end, Dr. Richman and his wife, Jennifer Hensel, started the Aviel Foundation committed to preventing violence and building compassion through brain health, research, community education, and engagement. Jeremy is a peace builder in the deepest sense of the word. As he will tell you, he lost his daughter, Aviel, for whom his foundation is named, in the horror of Sandy Hook. 
He has taken this experience and dedicated his life to understanding the causes of violence and helping people organize in their own communities for healthy brains. The mission of the Aviel Foundation is to prevent violence and build compassion in communities by fostering brain science, research, community engagement, and education. So Jeremy, we can't tell you how honored we are that you are here with us today. We hope you'll consider our community a home for you and for your family. We support you not only with the increasing emphasis that the peace building community is putting on neuroscience, but on a much deeper personal level as well. We hope you know that we stand with you and your family and dedicate ourselves to honoring the memory of your beautiful daughter and all of the, our work on peace in the world. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, an, sort of a, a different way of looking at science and the way we can use it to prevent violence and build compassion through research and education both. And I have to s express uh, my profound uh, gratitude for being invited to speak here and to, to be invited into such an amazing community. And I think that being in a community is is really the key um, to peace, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to make some introductions as, as I start out um, in, the, in the brief talk that I have. First, I want to introduce you to my favorite organ, the brain. Um, the brain is just another organ, like the heart, the lung, the liver, the kidneys. It can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. But unlike the other organs, the brain is difficult to study and people are surprised when they find that we know less about brain science than we do about any of our other sciences, bar none. We know more about the subatomic structures, we know more about the bottoms of our oceans, the surface of the moon, than we do about our brains. And as one of our 15-year-old interns put it really profoundly, she said, considering this is the organ we use to consider, it's really ironic how little we know about it. <laughs> But it's difficult to study the brain. It's housed in our skulls. It's not WYSIWYG. You can't take it out and look at it for a while and figure out what it does. Um, so there's a lot more pieces of the puzzle missing from, from this than all the other organs. And so we begin to think of it in a very uh, ethereal, invisible way. We think of it, um, here's my body. This is where you know, the, the action happens. But where am I? I'm somewhere else. It's separate. But we have to recognize all of our behaviors come from this organ. And therefore, they're all biochemical in nature. And you can have healthy and you can have unhealthy uh, behaviors, just like you can have uh, healthy and unhealthy hearts and lungs and livers and kidneys. So we need to fill in some of these missing puzzle pieces. And, um, and that's what we're all about. So let me give you a brief introduction to myself in a couple of different ways. First, uh, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I got really interested in studying the brain in neurosciences because I had a, a, a grandfather when I was a kid that had Alzheimer's disease. How many of you have been touched by that disease in some way? Almost everybody. Uh, when I was young, it was, the disease wasn't well known and, it, and it, it turns out the disease is so much more than I can't remember things it really changes your personality profoundly. You become a different person. And while it was really tragic that my grandfather suffered uh, in this way, it also fascinated me who we are all the way down to our core really depends on the proper functioning of this organ, the brain. So I went into studying the brain uh, as a result of this passion. And the only reason I highlight this, and I, I do this really, it's important in young audiences, to highlight the importance of letting things, experiences in your life touch you down to your heart. Because when you have a passion, when you have a reason for doing something, you get so much personal satisfaction in life when you're pursuing things that, that are personal and, and touch you. So uh, there's, there's a great quote that is often attributed to, to the Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, but he was actually quoting Nietzsche when he said, those who have the why can endure anyhow. So I always encourage people to find the why in life because then there's no obstacles. There's just great learning opportunities. I also need to introduce myself in another way. My wife and I, as parents, who in 2006 had a beautiful baby girl, Aviel, uh, 
She became the brightest uh, light in any room, a smile that could melt anybody, break down any barriers, uh, loved stories. She, she loved stories to fall asleep, dry, driving in the car, <laughs> going to the bathroom. She had, she had to have a story all, all the time. And she really, uh, she really got it. She realized her whole life was a story. And that everything that she did could be told through a lens of this was a great adventure. Going to the grocery store, who knew? <laughs> Unfortunately, as Melanie pointed out, her story came to a, a horribly tragic ending when she was murdered in her first grade classroom with 19 of her classmates and six of her educators on a very dark Friday, December 14th of 2012 in Newtown, Connecticut. And as you can imagine, that touched us about as close as you can be touched. This is uh, such a profoundly heartbreaking phenomenon to lose a child in a violent way like this that it really turns your world upside down. Uh, to, to try to paint a picture of it is really difficult, but you feel like the world is spinning and you're gonna fly off. And so literally Jen and I were on the floor for, for days trying to figure out what we were gonna do, how we were gonna try to reach out and prevent this kind of heartbreak and tragedy from happening again. And as we would travel around the, the world talking to people, trying to figure out uh, how to address this epidemic of violence that we have, particularly in our country, people would express their sentiment to us with an interesting uh, statement. I can't imagine what you're going through. I can't imagine how, how hard that would be. And while, of course, we appreciate the sentiment, the irony is that they are imagining it when they say that, and that they are stepping into those shoes just for a second, and they're horrified. But we all need to do that. We have to step into those shoes because that is the connection to your heart. And the only way to be motivated to do something is to be touched in that way. So we really can imagine and really need to imagine it because we become involved when we allow ourselves to be touched. So we have a trademark you can imagine. And on the brighter side of that tunnel, it's the imagination that sets us free to make tomorrow better, and it's the imagination that we need to use to create something better tomorrow. Uh, a statement that I, I think is really important for us all to embrace that comes from this imagination is the concept that few are guilty, but all are responsible, from uh, A.J. Heschel. We are all responsible for being part of a community and ensuring the health of that community, for advocating for ourselves, for our loved ones, and we have to take that, that uh, responsibility very seriously. The other uh, quote that I really like that's appropriate here is, is, uh, is one that's hard to find out who, who originally said it, but uh, it's mostly attributed to Reverend Watson. Be kind. Everyone that you, that you meet is fighting a hard battle. And I see this every time I travel, every time I meet somebody, you look them in the eyes, everybody has a tragedy. Everybody is facing some great adversity. And you need to recognize you can't see those battles. They're in there, though, and you have to be kind as a result. So what can be done? We created the Aviel Foundation uh, with a specific mission. Both Jen and I are scientists, and we said, well, we need to approach this in a scientific way. That's the way that we see the world. We answer why questions for a living. That's what scientists do. So we created a foundation in honor of our daughter to leave a legacy with a mission to prevent violence and build compassion through neuroscience, research, community engagement, and education. And let me expand on that just a little bit. We're researchers, so on the one side of the coin, we want to fund, to foster, to encourage neuroscience-based research that bridges biochemical sciences, and I'll expand on this in upcoming slides, and behavioral sciences. And we want to make the study of the brain in, in any form that doesn't have to be a test tube or a neuroscientist or a, a clinician, a psychiatrist, a neurologist. It could be an engineer that builds the next machine that allows us to affordably and accurately measure brain activity. It could be, um, it could be a, a peacekeeper who comes up with a, a, a paradigm or a program that helps us heal, be resilient, um, and be peaceful. But we want to make that study, that endeavor, lucrative and prestigious so that people will want to go into that field. We also recognize that science in a vacuum 
is of little or no value unless you give it to the everyday citizen in a way that they can approach it, embrace it, and use it as a tool. So the other side of that coin is community engagement and education. It's the what then. We want to provide tools to the everyday citizen. We want to make the study and understanding of the brain knowable to everybody because at the end of the day, really, we all own this information. We paid for it. We really deserve to have it in a way that we can use it. And this will foster empathy, increase connection, and encourage people to take action. And we, we love the, the statement, knowledge is power, but we think it goes beyond that. We think knowledge is empowering. And once you've been infected, you can't do anything but take action. So what are the tools that we can use? How do we study the brain? And how do we link the, what's happening under the hood here to the behaviors that we see? And that's where I think a lot of the shadow, the mystery, the invisible nature of things that are mental come from this uh, very complex world of how do you study the brain? What can you know about it? Well, we have some really great tools. <clears throat> we can watch the brain. We can see it. And not only can we see it, we can watch it while it does something. So you can say, this is your brain on joy, this is your brain on anger, this is your brain on frustration. We can look at it. <clears throat> we can also do the pee in the cup kind of science. We can take a cheek swab, a urine sample, blood sample, the fluid science, and we can measure things like I doodled some of our stress chemicals like cortisol, adrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, neurotransmitters and hormones that you can measure that correlate with behaviors. And we also have the wonderful world now of genetics, where we've sequenced the entire genome. I'm not going to pretend that we think we know what all the genes do or what they all are yet. We're making discoveries every day. But we do know the whole sequence of the genome. And we can identify the presence or absence of genetic material with behaviors. And now we have the amazing science of how the environment influences those genes. The, what we call on top of the genetics, the epigenetics. And we're going to expand a little bit on that. But these are the tools that we have. These are the tools of the trade. So we need to build some bridges with these tools to the behavioral sciences. The link between the pee and the cup science and the sort of tell me about your mother science that we picture somebody laying on the couch and giving their, giving their history. And we have some bridges just to illustrate so that maybe you can connect to what I'm saying. We have the molecule serotonin here on the left. We know that when you have low or inappropriate levels of serotonin in parts of the brain, that's associated with depression. That's why we take things like Prozac, SSRIs, serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors. We have a bridge between the biochemical and the behavioral science. What we need to fill in is those pieces of the puzzle that relate to things like reactive violence, where somebody uh, explodes inappropriately and becomes very violent in a reactive fashion. The guy that goes road rage or the kid in the lunch line that feels affronted when you step on his new shoes and gets violent. And what's the difference between the reactively violent individual's brain and the proactive or instrumentally violent individual who's disenfranchised, who uh, uh, becomes a sort of a extremist? Uh, this could be uh, your terrorist. It could also be your serial rapist or your your, uh, your pedophile, somebody that pines away, thinks of ways to lash out in an antisocial way against society. And what's the difference between their brains and the everyday citizen's brain? Those are the pieces of the puzzle that we need to fill in. But we have some barriers to our understanding of these pieces. We have the mental barrier. Right now, we diagnose diseases of the brain, uh, mental illnesses, based on symptoms and syndromes, groups of symptoms, with expert opinion and checklists. Now, I'm not being so heavy-handed. This is really the best that we've had for a long time, but we need to move beyond this. Here's the problem. Can you imagine going into the doctor, and she looks at you, and she says, well, your nose is running, your eyes are puffy and scratchy, your throat hurts, you're a cold. You know, wow, that bone's sticking out. You're a broken arm. You're a colon cancer. But if you go into the doctor feeling depressed, overwhelming grief for a period of time, and she goes to a checklist and you answer yes to five out of nine questions on a questionnaire, you're depressed and you're bipolar and you are schizophrenic and your child is ADHD. There's two huge problems here. One, we haven't found anything wrong. We didn't identify a pathology, so there's really no hope. And 
we're moving away from this, but more frequently than not, we define the individual as the disease. We don't say you're colon cancer, you're a rhinovirus, you're the flu. But we do say your child is ADHD, schizophrenic, bipolar. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you tell a child he's got a learning disorder, he's gonna have a learning disorder. We need to move away from that. We need to make the invisible world of mental a visible one. Name it what it is. There's so much fear and trepidation and stigma associated with this invisible world of mental that people don't get help for themselves, don't get help for their loved ones, and this is certainly the largest contributor to uh, why uh, the Sandy Hook shooter never got help, never was intervened, and it resulted in horrible tragedy. We need people to feel that it's a matter of chemistry and not character, to feel comfortable talking about brain illnesses and brain health in the way that it is. Can you imagine going to the doctor and she looks at your child and says, well, little Johnny's right in the middle of the growth curve, good job with the improving his diet, but we did find a little too much dopamine in his right cingulate cortex, which is a really fancy way of saying, this explains his behavioral impulse control problems at school. There's no character judgment there. You've already gone out and read every self-help parenting book there is anyway. You need, some, you need some help. And now they're saying, well, there's hope. We did find a problem, and this is what we're gonna do to try to, to prevent it. There's no, there's no stigma attached with that, and we need to move in that visible direction. So if you get anything out of this talk, I really encourage you to recognize that it's brain health. Take the word mental out of everything. You need a new brain-tality. We need to think of it, take it out. It doesn't mean anything, it has no value. Um, you know, we need to rename the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Disorders Administration. We need, to, we need to take mental out of our lexicon and just call it what it is because that, that does a, a large uh, service towards getting help and, and decreasing the fear and trepidation. So can we study violence? Is there a paradigm, a model that we, can, that we can create where we can look at risk factors that lead to violence and protective factors that lead away from it so that we can then associate biochemical changes with the behaviors that we see? How do we predict it? Is there any way that we can do that? And it turns out there's a lot of risk factors that lead to violence and protective factors that lead away from it towards what we could only call, say, compassion, kindness, connection, communication, uh, resilience. It turns out that there are. And, um, and if I have a lot more time, I, I like to go through a lot of these examples, but I'm gonna really cruise just through a couple of them. And I wanna really highlight the important ones. One uh, that I start with, oftentimes people say, you know, we're, we're animals, humans are just animals, we're probably very violent, and we come up with these debates. The, the nature-nurture debate is a very famous one. But as with a lot of our debates, global warming, for example, the, the, the world is warming up. We could debate why it is, but it's a fact that it is. There's no debate. And in this case, the nature-nurture debate, there's no debate. We know that the, your genes influence how you see the environment, how you interact in it, what you think is relevant. And the environment shapes what genes are expressed, where they're expressed, what organs are expressed, and how long they're expressed, or to what extent they're expressed. You can't separate them. So if you leave here today and you ask, if somebody ever asks you, is it nature or nurture, is it your genes or in the environment, give them a really smug smile and say, of course it is. <laughs> it's both. There's a great quote by Don Hebb, a, a famous behaviorist, and I love this quote. He said, what contributes more to the area of a rectangle, the length or the width? And I'll go as far as to say that there is no behavior, there's no disease that is purely one or the other. There's always a contribution of both nature and nurture. So keep that in mind. You're not born dealt a bad, bad hand uh, that, can't be, that can't be influenced, and you can't be born with good genes uh, into a, a bad environment that purely leaves you in that environment. We can, we can always influence this. And that's because, uh, in other words, if you're born in an adverse environment, you're, you're abused, you, you grow up in Sierra Leone that's very hostile, um, yes, you can end up a violent and psychopathic individual. But if you're raised in a nurturing and healthy environment, that same individual has the, uh, uh, the great chance to be the, your resilient leader, your Fortune 500 CEO, your president. That's because our brains are plastic throughout our entire lives. 
Neuroplasticity refers to the ability of the brain to adapt and change in response to environment. It occurs on a molecular level, so at the, the points of contact where your brains communicate with each other, we call these the synapses. The, the proteins, the, the constituent, the chemicals that are in those communication zones, the synapses, it can change. You can influence the, what's there. It occurs on a cellular level. Contrary to what I was taught when I was a kid that you know, you're born with everything under the hood here that you get and that's it, take care of it. We do grow neur neurons. We do replace them. We're doing them right now. Some of us more than others. <laughs> and this neuroplasticity occurs on a regional basis, kind of like a muscle. You know, if you, if you use regions of the brain more, that they, they become reinforced. You deliver nutrients and clear out waste more effectively, just like a muscle is use it or lose it. And when we're born, we have about 100 billion neurons. Okay, that's a lot packed in there, 100 billion. And each and every one of those neurons has the possible, the potential to talk to and communicate with 2,500 other neurons. So think about that, each one communicating with 2,500 others, talking to 2,500 others. That's an amazingly elaborate network of communication. And as you reach about the age of three, all the way up through adolescence, which, which believe it or not, ends for women around 21 and for men around 24, not 18, that communication completely expands about to, a, to the point where each cell, each of those 100 billion neurons can communicate with up to 15,000 individual other cells. When you talk about complexity, that is a machine more complex than any of those computers that you have in your pockets. That's an amazing machine. And as you become an adult, you're not becoming more stupid. You, but you do prune away those connections, and that's what makes you the unique individual that you are. That's your personality. What you use becomes reinforced, and what you don't is lost. Uh, which brings us to the point, again, another quote, I love quotes. Uh, this one comes from the ex-slave uh, Frederick Douglass. Because the brain is built this way, it's really important that we approach uh, creating healthy environments for our children because it's easier to, re to, to, uh, to build the strong child than it is to repair a broken adult. Okay, we ha we, but we have to remember that our brains are plastic throughout our lives, so even the adult can be fixed. It's just a lot harder. Um, let's move to the, for the sake of time, um, since I only have a couple minutes. When we look at this paradigm, and we can identify in a scientific sense risk factors that lead to increased uh, likelihood of engaging in violence. Um, and it's, it's unfortunately human nature to kind of go down this list and look at the negative and go, okay, we have a healthy family unit. I, I, my kids wear helmets when they play sports. They don't get traumatic brain injuries. Um, there's no toxins in my environment. They get good physical uh, activity. There's low. Violent, they don't get to watch violent media or play violent video games. Um, I'm good to go. But that's not how the brain works. Unfortunately, if you're not actively pursuing protective factors, you're moving downhill. It's like a muscle. It's either hypertrophying and getting bigger or atrophying and getting smaller. There's no good to go. So if you were to look at this and say, are, what are the protective factors that I should best uh, spend my time? I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them. I'm gonna cruise through them. One of them, without question, needs to be self-mastery. The ability to set and achieve goals, name and tame your emotions, and recognize how your behaviors influence other people's behaviors. And when I, we call this emotional intelligence, but it goes by all these other names over the years. It's, it's getting a lot of popular press right now for, I think, great reasons. Um, it turns out that parents a lot of times hear that we want to teach this in schools and they say, oh, come on, we've got so much. My kids need to, do, to learn reading, writing, and math, right? The science, that's the important stuff. Well, I, they can relax because if you, if you teach social emotional skills in the school, kids improve 11 to 17 percent on their academic test scores. That's a profound improvement in their test scores. But while we're at it, let's look at those test scores. What do they mean? Now clearly, if you're gonna be a biologist, you need to know biology. A physicist needs to know some math. But what do these test scores academically worldwide prove? Well, they don't really predict anything. Well, one thing that they do predict, and it's almost disturbing, the better that you do on a, on a standardized test worldwide, the more money your family has. What does that mean? 
It means that uh, somebody is writing the test and that person is usually um, uh, somebody with great means. But, but your emotional intelligence predicts success in life. And usually I do a social experiment and I have people define success but for the sake of time. Let me just tell you that your, uh, your skill set, how good you would rate yourself or your parents would rate you, or believe it or not, your kindergarten teacher, how they rate your emotional intelligence predicts health. It predicts your incarceration rate. It predicts your substance abuse liability. It predicts how often you see the doctor. It predicts wealth. It predicts your credit score and how much income you're going to have as an adult. It also predicts your parenting style and it also predicts your satisfaction with life. So if there's anything that we're going to instill in our, in our kids at school, it should be uh, social emotional skill building. Let's go up to another one. I met a, a, a lot, some great people from Wisconsin and um, this is a really great study in terms of social justice and perhaps approaching how we could reform the, the, uh, the criminal uh, corrections uh, and, uh, and uh, processing system. They have a huge problem in this area, south, uh, southeast Wisconsin, with violence. And when they looked at the, the most heinous offenders, these are juveniles that are murderers, rapists, and have been uh, uh, incarcerated for aggravated assault. They go through the juvenile processing system. They go through time served, and within five years, over 70% of them recommit the same heinous crime again, 70%. And in this area uh, near uh, Madison, uh, they said, we can't afford this. We can't afford this on a moral and philosophical level, but we literally can't afford it financially. Because these beds cost in the range of forty-five dollars to $65,000 uh, per bed, and we have too many of them, and they're going to recommit, and now they're adults, and that's even more expensive, $75,000, $85,000 per bed. What can we do? They, re, they looked at the paradigm, and we have a compression paradigm in our country where we s segregate from society and compress and compress and compress to the point that every time that you infringe on a, on, a, on a rule, you're isolated further and further and further. You're losing more and more and more community engagement and rights. They said, can we turn this paradigm around? Instead of having it run by law enforcement, have law enforcement serve as security and safety, but now what we're going to do is we're going to have healthcare providers run the facility. And we're going to give cognitive behavioral therapy to these kids, give them one-on-one -on -one face time, okay? This isn't hand-holding. I mean, these kids are, are heinous criminals, but they're shown that their behaviors have a, have a value and a meaning and do affect other people, that their lives matter. And I don't think, uh, and I, this could be argued by a therapist certainly better than my, by me, I don't think it was the cognitive behavioral therapy that mattered, it was this one-on-one -on -one attention and time giving. But that could be, that could be studied. But the results are, are unbelievable. Within just two years of applying this program at the Mendota Corrections Facility, following the kids out for five years, they cut the re recidivism, they cut the um, recommit of the crimes in half. That's a profound result that needs to be replicated and expanded in, in other populations, larger groups, and I would love to see that in the adult population. But we can change this paradigm. And the reason that I think we can change it is because, while a lot of young audiences often come up to me and they say, you know, we're just animals at the end of the day. It's, in our, it's, our, it's our nature to be violent. So let's look at that for a second. It turns out that what makes us special, particularly, is our brains. And it's not that we have bigger brains, but we have a lot more of a part of the brain, the neocortex, the outside part, the part that you always draw with all the, the, the bumps and ridges. That neocortex to total vo brain volume, that's what we have a lot of. And what does that correlate with? It turns out that the volume of neocortex to brain ratio correlates with the group size that we live in, which leads to the conclusion that we either have big brains because we have uh, large groups, or we live in large groups because we have a big neocortex. Regardless, we've evolved to live in large communities. And when you look at the evolutionary process, we don't evolve on the same genetic level that the other animals do. We, we, we evolve at a much different process. In days past, you have Darwin's finches here. This guy in the upper left has a big fat beak because the environment where, where they live, they have a, a selective advantage if they can crack tough seeds. 
and get the, the carbohydrates inside. These uh, finches in the bottom right, well, they live in an environment where the advantage is obtained if they adapt genetically to, to a long beak that reaches into the flower petal and gets it out of the, the, the pollen in the middle there. But humans, if, if we need to crack a seed, we build a nutcracker. If we're cold, we build jackets, air conditioning for the heat. We went to the moon just to check it out, <laughs> right? We evolve on a different level. Richard Dawkins has a great term that he tried to rhyme with genetic, he called it memetic, the transfer of ideas. We adapt our environment to suit us through the exchange of these ideas and we evolve by sharing our knowledge and those that are able to do it effectively to communicate, connect, collaborate and create, those are the evolved humans and that's our evolution. So I would argue that yes, while we are just animals, to be human means to be humane and that's what we need to evolve to. And we're, uh, we're always hung up on differences. I think it's important to point out that if you look at on a genetic level, there is no such thing as race. We're really hung up on race, but there is just one race. And I'm not saying in a hippy trippy, not only in a hippy trippy tree huggy sense, <laughs> but literally there is no such thing. These two girls in Nigeria are just as genetically identical to these two girls in Southern California. That's a fact. So am I saying that when you get your next job application or, or college entrance exam, you cross this off and you say, hey, I'm a human. <laughs> well, yes, I wish I could say that, but while there is no such thing as there's only one race, there's no such thing as different races, there's unfortunately the existence of racism. And until we can normalize the playing field and get rid of those differences that are completely contrived, we've got a lot of work to do and that'll go a long way towards peace to recognize them. So uh, I appreciate your time. Um, we all need to, to recognize that the brain is our seat of behavior, that we all are in control of our brain health and advocating for our own and those of our loved ones. Um, I could tell you about what we're doing specifically if you have time. Um, but, uh, and ways that you can help, so please, uh, I always, I promise my wife I'll always say, find us on Facebook and like us, tweet us on Twitter. It really matters because we can s share this message of brain health. Uh, so p put it out there. By all means, donate if you have the means and the desire to do so. But, uh, but find us, uh, like us, tweet us, um, Instagram us, whatever that, that verb is. <laughs> and and just, to, uh, just to conclude, uh, remember why we're all here and what we have, uh, to do in front of us because it really matters. Thank you, Jeremy. That was just, I can't imagine a more inspiring and wonderful way to start the morning. We just have a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure we could take just a couple of questions, but also hope that we can invite you back every year to have just much more of a dialogue and everything you talked about. I would be honored, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So questions? Yes, and we'll, we'll cluster a couple. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was really uh, amazing. Um, my father is a therapist in a prison, um, and I'm going to be sharing a lot of this with him. And while he is a, a really great empathetic therapist, um, sometimes he does struggle with seeing these uh, prisoners who have such horrific backgrounds and pasts and have then gone on to do some horrific things. And he does struggle with that sometimes. And I'm wondering um, what you would say to him and what you would suggest he say to uh, the men that he sees um, to give them hope about the, the preventing and the healing of, of brain health and violence. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, what can be done? particularly in these adults that, you know, um, we've pulled out of society. So specifically, um, uh, I would make sure that he has uh, a good support structure to recognize the difference between empathy, which would be taking in all of that, that emotion and feelings, uh, and compassion, which is the hope that you can actually do something with those feelings. Um, and that he needs to take care of, you know, self-help first. 
um, what he can tell his patients or his his uh, you know his patients um, is to recognize that uh, their their experiences, the adversity that they faced, have a large contribution to their behaviors. They don't excuse or forgive the behaviors, but it goes a long way to recognizing there's a reason that you're acting that way. There's a reason that this happened. And there are many injustices in the world uh, that, that you have to uh, face and, and work with, but that there's hope that this brain that, you, that you're, you're uh, fortunate enough to have can be fixed, can be adjusted, and that there is help to that, and that you have to address it and recognize that that's influencing your behaviors. I think that's empowering in and of itself. Um, in the large scope of things, while we call it corrections, unfortunately, beyond deterrence, it doesn't serve any form of correction, and we really need to uh, kind of uh, reform our, our correctional process. Another question? Yes, sir. Marathi has invented uh, uh, vaccines to control the diseases. Can there be a vaccine be invented to control that violent, uh, that agitate the violent neuron in future? Well, so, um, so I'm going to probably say in the, in someday, maybe, it's not likely. Um, the contagion, violence as a contagion, and I, I love to picture that, um, and the cure violence people um, would definitely get that. Um, there's no question that violence is a public health threat, and we need to look at it in that way. And it is a contagion. Violence definitely leads to violence to self and to others. Um, but there probably is no magic pill, no, no uh, antibiotic, no antibody, no immunity that we can get um, with one injection. But we can definitely use boosters and, and help that. I don't think it, that it's going to be a pharmacologic intervention. And if it is, it probably won't be a standalone intervention. It's going to be something else that um, hopefully one of the young minds in here will come up with. But um, I don't think that there will be one injection. But it could be in a more uh, philosophical level. Yes, we could be uh, actively pursuing all those protective factors that will have a very profound, almost immunization effect on our, on our community and our culture. And uh, one final. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. I wonder if you can talk more about the, um, on the negative risk side, you mentioned violent media. Yeah. Um, is there a way you can study the impact of violence in the media, say, there's the video games, there's the entertainment, which I think is significant. But what about our politics, world affairs, our, our wars, you know, these, these ideas that sort of legitimize state violence? Is there, how do you measure that? How can, is there a way to, how do you measure it? But also what could be done, not in a vaccine sense, but in a preventive or the positive side? What a great question. And in the expanded version of the talk, I go really into detail about that. And when I ask people and I tell them violent media, leads to, is a, is a great risk factor to violence. And I ask, what media am I talking about? Almost everybody says video games. But importantly, we do know how to study the effects of media violence on increased aggression and purposeful aggression being violence. Uh, from 1960s to present, there is countless scientifically solid peer-reviewed journals that show the very clear positive correlation with the news television um, in, in all aspects, our movies, the way that we portray it, uh, that is correlated. So much data, in fact, that two Surgeon Generals addressed this, Satcher and Coop, issuing the, uh, the equivalent of a Surgeon General warning on violent television, and we've done nothing about it. Um, now, when it comes to video games, you think television is completely passive. You sit back, uh, you got your, your tub of corn, and you're being entertained. A video game is first person oftentimes. It's fully immersive. You're part of the game. That's why you're playing it. And when the majority of video games, um, well, when a, a large fraction of them, 30, 40% of them, are violent in their, in their nature, that is what they are. Um, and, and I would say, you know, almost every, virtually every game has a violent aspect to it. About 80% of them do. And when you think that 95% of adolescents are playing video games, 
that's a real problem. But the solution isn't to take them away. Uh, violent, just the violent video game industry represents around $1.2 billion. But that's, um, that's our dollars. So the purchase power is in your pocket. If we take that purchase power and we say, you know what, we don't want that. We want this. The video game platform is such an ideal opportunity to get to our kids, to help to enforce good behaviors. And we need some creativity there. I mean, nobody's going to play fun with numbers besides maybe me. Um, <laughs> We need some really cool games and we need to reward those video game manufacturers that are willing to move into that space to create games that reinforce positive behaviors because they're not going to go away and all our kids are playing them. What an opportunity to, to a you know, powerful tool to educate that we have. We just need to use it in a responsible fashion. Well, on that note, I want to thank you again so much, Jeremy, for being with us and we wish you great success for the foundation and hope you'll let us know how we can support you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, have you noticed how neuroscientists are like the new rock stars of the peace building world? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. That was really great. Um, and now we have a different group of rock stars here. Um, for those who've just joined you, my name is Nancy Lindborg. Um, I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace. And uh, this, this is really a terrific conference. Thank you, Melanie, and everyone at the Alliance for Peace Building for putting this together. We um, are talking today with this panel on next-gen fragility, new ap approaches to peace and governance in fragile states. Um, so our goal for the next hour is looking at the ways in which conflict, violence, and governance converge in fragile environments. Um, and I'm joined by an incredible panel, people who have deep expertise, uh, very, very thoughtful on this topic, um, including Sarah Cliff, who's the director of the Center of International Cooperation at New York University. Sarah's worked for over 20 years in countries that are either emerging from conflicts or in political transitions. She also spent much of her career at the World Bank and wrote one of the seminal works that's guided many of us, the uh, World Development Report in 2011. Still a very powerful document. Um, we also have Claire Lockhart, who's the co-founder and CEO of the Institute for State Effectiveness, uh, the author of another critical book, Fixing Failed States, which she co-authored with Ashraf Ghani, um, uh, now the president of Afghanistan. And she previously served as an advisor to the UN in Afghanistan during the bond process. Um, Pradeep Pariyar is the founder of the Nepal uh, Policy Center, which is a youth-led think tank in Kathmandu. And he's a board member of the Association of Youth Organizations in Nepal and recently appointed by the Nepali government to the National Youth Policy Review Task Force. Congratulations. Um, Grace Yeyeni Mason is a social worker who spent nearly a decade working on women's empowerment, advocacy, and HIV and AIDS in communities across Liberia. Um, she's also the co-founder and executive director of the Women's Movement for Sustainable Development in Liberia. Um, and finally, we have Eileen Babbitt, who's the director of the Institute for Human Security and co-director of the program on human rights and conflict resolution at the Fletcher School. And Eileen has done research that has informed many of us uh, in very powerful ways on identity-based conflicts, trust building in post-war environments, and that critical interface between peace building and human rights. Um, and she's worked as a, facilita a facilitator and trainer in conflict environments around the world. So this is an incredible panel that we have. Uh, we'll take questions from everybody after we have a few rounds of questions among the panel. And for those of you who are following online, be sure to use the hashtag uh, PeaceCon2016. We'll also uh, be taking questions from Twitter. Um, so this is such an amazing moment for this conversation. Um, we just, uh, as I said earlier, had the World Summit, uh, 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 the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul, where conflict was really front and center. Um, and there was an amazing moment at the roundtable 
on preventing and ending violent conflict uh, with world leaders, where the most forward-leaning speakers at the table were the leaders of fragile states, Tunisia, Mali, Somalia. Um, they're the ones who were talking about some of these core concepts of inclusivity, uh, accountability, and ending corruption. Um, I would love uh, to have uh, your reflections, um, particularly with the Sustainable Development Goal 16 in front of us. Hope everybody here knows what Goal 16 is, yes? This is a wonky audience. Uh, you know, <laughs> that without accountable, inclusive societies and access to justice for all, we will never achieve the rest of our uh, sustainable development goals, our global goals. So, um, at the Grace, I'm gonna start with you. Um, when we look at the challenges of fixing fragile states, of enabling fragile states to really move forward on peace and prosperity, um, very complex, complicated environments, what's the role of civil society? What, have, what do you think we've learned over the past five years of how civil society is, is crucial um, on this, this set of, of challenges? Okay. Um. First of all, I want to say thank you that I'm at this very important meeting. And your quest for your question, one thing we need to understand is that civil society is actually like a bulldog. We are the ones supposed to be looking at government and where government is going. If they are going wrong, we tell them, hey, you are not doing this. And if they are not go doing good, we also compliment them. But uh, if you ask me that question, civil society in Liberia over the period especially from, the, the, from 2005, when we had our first democratically elected president, civil society has been on the forefront. We have been engaged in most of all the activities in terms of reforms, in terms of peace building, especially focusing at the community levels. So in as much as there are a lot of challenges in the work we do, but civil society has always been at the forefront in these different areas. And one of the things that we also have some problem with is the issue of corruption. And in terms of talking about corruption from the civil society end, it has been like once you talk about corruption, you are anti-government. Anti-government. Yes. It means you don't like the government. You're, and, and for us, we don't see it that way. We think we should be telling government where they are going wrong and where they are not going uh, wrong. But that is a big challenge in terms of doing the work we do. Other than that, civil society has been at the forefront in most of the things that, is, that are happening in Liberia. Our own regret in recent times has been uh, the drastic drug down of the United Nations missions just before the 2017 elections. Mm -hmm. We're going to be having to elections in 2017. The UN missions in Liberia will be drawing down on the 30th of June, 2016. And we think this is also a challenge. And that uh, in as much as we want the, 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 the peace and security of Liberia to be in the hands of Liberians, we think there's still a need to have uh, the United Nations missions in Liberia, maybe up to the elections, and then after the elections, we can, we can move forward. Pradeep, I want to ask you the same question. Nepal has undergone a long, painful transition. Um, what, has been, what has been the role of civil society and of peace builders, and where do you see the priorities going forward? Thank you very much for having me here. It's okay? Yeah. Uh, when King took over power in 2005, 2001 to 2005, when there were a political party are divided, when, when parliament dissolved, and there is a only civil society uh, very active, and when political party organized rally, there is only 150 to 200 people, and when uh, civil society started uh, started campaign against the against the king, and then there is a thousand and thousand people, and that's people movement started by the civil society. When that's uh, uh, when 
that happens, but after that, uh, political party uh, took over the power and civil society are really divided into political parties. Mm -hmm. They are divided into name of the political party. And right now, there is a not really uh, civil society. They are divided in terms of political parties mm -hmm. and they have a little interest to get the, some appointment, to get the, some thing from the government. So it's not a very strong civil society right now. When there were, when there was a king took over the power, civil society was so active to achieve the, uh, some common goals. But after that, there is no common goals. So there is a little interest uh, within the uh, civil society. So that's, that's hap happened right now. And Pradeep, how did that happen? Uh, what happened that co-opted civil society? When there is a uh, civil society had an earlier common goal to to throne king, but after the political party comes over into power, they are divided because of their limited interests, because they have a small interest. I already mentioned they want to get something from the political party and the government uh, when democracy restored. restored uh, before democracy restored, that time they have only one goal, common goals. Now there, there is not common goals, I think so. Civil society has uh, divided in, in, in terms of uh, their political ideology and political thoughts. Eileen, you're nodding over there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, what, what both Liberia and Nepal have experienced is, is trying to restore uh, that state society confidence and because of the lack of legitimacy mm -hmm. that both their governments suffered from. You've looked a lot at that. How, wh what's the best pathway back and what can outsiders do to help states and civil society recreate that legitimacy? Um, well, the, the project we've been focusing on is, is asking that question. And the question we've started with is, what is it that creates legitimacy in the eyes of the citizens of the country, so-called internal legitimacy. Uh, because the research shows that if a state is perceived to be legitimate by its people, then it has more capacity to manage conflict, to operate effectively, et cetera. And there's a, there's a dilemma in the answer, because the answer we've found is participation and inclusion even in something as a material as provision of basic services, like education, health, water, et cetera. Um, one of our colleagues did, participated in a multi-year uh, and multi-country study of whether the provision of basic services leads to state legitimacy. Because do donors believe that that's the relationship, that if you give money for state capacity building, particularly in basic services, that you then create legitimacy for the government. And it turns out not to be true, <laughs> uh, which is rather a surprising finding, given that the donor community in 2014 contributed $36 billion to the creation of social, social infrastructure and basic services with the idea that it would provide this benefit. What the study found, and this was a, a study funded by DFID, um, is that the provision of services per se did not create perceptions of legitimacy. What did create perceptions of legitimacy was if people participated in, at the community level, participated in the design of those services and also had a mechanism for voicing grievances if the services were not adequate. This was the only relationship that actually mattered in terms of, of legitimacy. So we, we all know or believe that participation and inclusion are important. What we were trying to figure out is, are there, is there any empirical data to support that belief? And it turns out in this context and in others, it's true. But then you have the dilemma that Pradeep just mentioned, which is the, the, the civil society is often fractured. And what appears legitimate to some may not appear or be seen as legitimate by others. And the real challenge, I think, for all of us is figuring out how to enable, facilitate, support multi-stakeholder discussions at the community level and at every level to work through those differences. 
because otherwise people end up getting left out, feeling silenced, and it reinforces division rather than creating the legitimacy that we would hope. Do, does the outside uh, donor community exacerbate that by emphasizing creation of political parties and pushing elections? It's an unintended consequence. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, it's with good intent because we have a functioning democratic uh, polity here in this country and in other Western countries. Well, yeah, I, yes. <laughs> You're right. That is a laughable. Line. Yeah, that's a laughable proposition. Sorry about that. Yeah, we think we do. Uh, we will again. Yeah. Grace and Pradeep, <laughs> how does that resonate with your experiences in Liberia and Nepal? Grace, did did uh, was there a mechanism that gave communities a voice and participation in development of services? I think what she said resonated very well with what, ha what is actually happening on the ground. Because uh, the need for community involvement is, not, is beyond the papers. It's beyond writing it on a paper. We need to interact with communities. And that is one thing that is not being present. So sometimes our government may write good reports for example, you had a stakeholders meeting and you had the chief wife there and you have maybe two other women. The report tells you that women were involved. <laughs> but the reality is that who were the women that were involved? Yeah. Are they women at the political levels? Are they community women that need to speak out? So that is very clear that the inclusion of communities is very crucial in us getting where we want to be. And for Liberia, I think that is one thing that we need to do. I tell you, a, 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 I gave you a, a, a story that um, in Grand Basel County, there was one of these big institutions. At the end of the civil crisis, this county uh, earned their source of income from blacksmithing. Anyone knows about blacksmith? Yeah. Okay. So uh, usually we'll sit in our <coughs> big offices maybe in New York, or maybe in Monrovia, or in Johannesburg, whatever. And we, we go online and get these information. We don't confirm them in the communities. We don't know what the processes are. And we sit and write these fabulous proposals. And this group wrote a proposal to build a blacksmith for this community. And with the intent that this will help the community to raise funds, to move their livelihood forward. But the, the, the biggest mistake they made was not to go on the grounds. Because traditionally, before you build a blacksmith, there must be some traditional rituals that take place. Mm. In the absence of that, they wouldn't use it. Yeah. So because they did not engage these communities, and mm. they built this big place, brought all of the facilities, and up to present is a forest. <laughs> so now we, we've yeah. written good reports that we did this work, but the reality is that it's not impacting the lives of the communities. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to, to uh, think twice on the way, on our approaches to be more community driven, to be more stakeholders driven, so that we get the input of the people who should be benefiting from our services. Yeah. Grace, thank you. Pradeep, um, in terms of the legitimacy of the Nepali government, have they sought community participation and engagement? Uh, can I share my, some of the pictures? No, uh, I, I, can, I can go on. Uh, if that's OK, that's fine. Uh, actually, when there, is a, when there is a war or when there is a, a yeah? Yeah, uh, uh, I want to share some of the picture. Continue. Uh, just we're gonna we're gonna keep this punchy though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look at this picture. <laughs> I want to stop in this picture. You can see the few, few. I have a huge respect on older generation. Uh, in the previous picture, there's a, you, you can see the, all the rest, all the caste group people in these pictures. But in this picture, you can see after this, when the peace agreement signs, uh, signed by these two leaders, after that, all the inclusion is not there. Mm 
when there a fighting was there, when there is a war was there, uh, there always inclusion. All the people there, all the caste, because they they have a common goals to achieve restore restore the democracy. But after this peace agreement signed, there is not inclusion perspective in, in the, their uh, in the leadership. Uh, I want to give few examples. When this peace agreement signed, after that there is a new government formed, but there, there were not uh, young people participation, there was not marginalized people participation in the government. So when we have a new election happen, that's a voice of marginalized people heard, and then there's many marginalized people in, in the Constitution Assembly, but the one they decide main things and main points in the in the what should be in the Constitution, but only five male leaders decide. Only five male leaders from the same caste groups. Mm. So there is a six, 601 <coughs> representative in the Constitution Assembly, but the one they need to decide and do agreement, they don't ask with their carers or leaders because they felt that we appointed you. We appointed because of us, you are here. Mm. So that's kind of mentality in the leadership. So that, that's how going on still. And then we have a first uh, constitution assembly dissolved, and then we have a second constitution assembly, and there are also 601 members. When they decide, now we have a new constitution, but still there is not marginalized voice, it's not heard. And then Madesi people, Dalit, Dalit is so-called low caste groups, and then women and marginalized groups are still continuing fighting with these leaders. When they were together to fight, restore the democracy, now we need to fight with these leaders. Yeah. That kind of situation over going on. When there are interim constitution, we have, a, we have an interim constitution. They wrote beautiful things in interim constitution. Now we have a new constitution, but they took out our uh, rights from the new constitution. Mm -hmm. That's why now still more than 50 people already died mm -hmm. and then still fighting going on, that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this kind of mindset with our leaders, but still that kind of situation going on. And, and Pradeep, does, does your appointment to the National Youth Policy Task Force signal any change of heart? Uh, the fact that they have such a task force? Yeah, we have now task force. As yesterday, I also mentioned with the, uh, in, in previous panel, uh, before coming to Washington, D.C., one of the ministers called me and then said, you did the really wrong thing. And I said, why? And then we put the, in the national youth policy 50% women participation. We ensure 50% women participant, participation, and now, uh, they need to fulfill the youth council with the 50% women participation. But political party are really afraid to, <coughs> afraid to include all the 50% women participation in the council. And they are threatening us like why you did all those kind of things. And I said uh, to minister, look at how it's impact in the near future. So that's kind of situation going on. I don't know why these people are like that, but we <laughs> still need to fight. And then we call uh, this justice uh, as a really race, really race. So we need to sometimes tired, but we need to fight, continue. So Pradeep, lack of inclusion, lack of consultation, lack of legitimacy. Claire, I know that, that ISC is looking at what are some of the successes and failures from the last decade or so of trying to do the state building transitional exercises. Um, how, does, how does this compare with what you are finding? What are some of the highlights of that? Well, it tracks quite closely to the conversation so far, and I'll highlight maybe just a couple of lessons that are emerging. One is the absolute centrality of citizen and community engagement and especially the youth, which, as we know, are the absolute majority of so many dynamic and growing countries around the world. And I think, you know, in part, it was one of the mistakes of the Millennium Development Goals. We spent a lot of attention on primary education and very young children, but we forgot about the teenagers and, and the youth. 
And you know, then there was an agenda of including them through sports and through activities, which was one step forward, but I think that's not enough for the youth. It's not just soccer matches and, and so on that's going to include them. They want to be included politically, but what are the avenues for political engagement? What are the ag avenues for economic engagement in the society that need to, to, to really make that a real, real avenue of inclusion? Um, so that's the first. Um, the second is, um, I think the field has made huge strides in, some people call it thinking and working politically. Of course, peace processes and transitional processes are intensely political. Um, but I think there are some real dilemmas and issues that need to be confronted here. Um, part of the field has, has now moved into, to recognize the importance of the political settlement and the grand bargain. And many of the grandees of the field, absolutely rightly, you, ne you, know, you need to do these deals to stop the fighting. And I think one can recognize the imperative of that. But too often, then the deal stops there. So what about the inclusion and having much more inclusive and broader processes that follow? I think the UN is recognizing this now with the Sustaining Peace Report that's just come out. Um, so what, what do we mean by thinking and working politically? And how can it have that much, much um, broader sense of participation in political processes. And I think that does mean about, you know, how do national political agendas get set? Do they get set by a few men <laughs> in smoke-filled smoke rooms? Or what are those processes for setting a national political and development agenda? Um, how do you engage people, not just in the capital city, but in the cities around the country and in the villages? How do you engage different stakeholder groups and what kind of political processes um, that are not only top down, but bottom up as, as well? Sarah, when you think back on your groundbreaking work of the World Development Report in 2011, and then CIC just did a really terrific evaluation of how we're doing with the New Deal for Fragile States, mm -hmm. which has these five peace building um, and uh, state building goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that the president of Somalia said uh, in Istanbul mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, Somalia is just now 20 years later getting to the point where it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's critical to fix the politics. Um, this is really hard. This is hard inside the country. It's really hard from an external perspective. So from all the work that you've done, what, where do you see uh, the greatest struggle and the greatest opportunity, particularly for civil society and external actors, to, mm. to, to provide the kind of support uh, that gets at this core issue? So if we think about the moment now and the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul, it has to be said that in terms of outcomes, we're not looking at that good a picture. Conflict, uh, deaths from violent conflict have gone up fivefold in the last five years. I always hope this is not correlated with the publication of the World Development Report, but certainly <laughs> the, performance, the performance since then has not been very good. And I think that there are really two key things we need to look at. Why we're not already, why we're not implementing what we already know, which is what many of the other panelists talked about, and what is new that has emerged in that period. So on what we already know, the balance in legitimacy of capability of states, capacity of states, inclusion of states, and accountability over issues like corruption, we keep on getting our external support to this balance wrong. So, for instance, in Iraq, in South Sudan, we quite clearly supported a kind of capability-led agenda, and we didn't push very hard on issues of inclusion and accountability, with quite disastrous results. Now, that's not an easy balance. So, for instance, in Somalia, there were some external programs to hold accountable the government through parliament, three or four years ago, when really the government didn't yet exist. So you can't also support accountability before you have some degree of capacity. But I think we get the, the balance wrong. The second aspect is what we invest in, and Eileen mentioned this. So the, the first three of the peace building and state building goals, political institutions, justice, and security, we don't invest in very much. 4% of our aid in political institutions, 3% in justice, 2% in security sector reform, separated from defense cooperation. So, for instance, in a country like Burundi, there was some investment in military reform, but almost nothing in the justice system, the police, political institutions, which we now see 
is leading to problems. And third, I added listening to you, but the, uh, the emphasis still on fast elections from external actors absolutely goes against all the lessons we have. That we know that without the surrounding institutions, pushing for very fast elections with a full handover without checks and balances has really severe drawbacks. So I think that's an issue with the drawdown of the mission in Liberia. It should, in fact, be waiting until after the elections, probably not even at the, the election. It's a huge challenge for us if a ceasefire proceeds in Syria, if there is the beginning of a political settlement, how would we avoid a situation of pushing there for very fast yeah. elections? i will just finish by highlighting what is, is new. We've seen much more middle income countries in conflict. Mm -hmm. I think that relates actually <coughs> to us applying these institutional indicators more broadly. And in the end, in the context of the sustainable development goals, we really need to see that as applying across high income, middle income, and low income, that fragility is not constrained to the lowest income of, of countries. We've seen a rise in geopolitical tensions, and we've seen, of course, the rise of violent extremism. Now, those things are linked. ISIS obviously has gained territory and ground in countries that already had civil conflict, that already had very weak institutions. Geopolitical conflicts have always exploited that kind of circumstance. But we really need to do more to think about how our different types of prevention, from the violence prevention that our first speaker talked about this morning, to conflict prevention, to prevention of violent extremism, linked together. Um, USIP is tri is uh, tri chairing along with uh, Carnegie and uh, the Center for New American Security, um, a, 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 an effort uh, working with a senior study group. Claire is one of our members uh, to identify key recommendations for the next administration on how can the U.S. government be more effective on addressing fragility. So I'm gonna shamelessly exploit each of you. I'm gonna ask you really quickly, give me one great idea to include in this, in this study. Eileen? Uh, I think the aid agenda should absolutely focus on the, on the uh, multi-stakeholder process and not simply, as Grace said, as a box to check off, but really understand what is involved, that these are political processes, people have to do analysis, they have to understand the local context, and they've got to put money into it. It can't simply be, again, a, a checked box. It has to be something with integrity. Great. I, I also go with her that there's, <laughs> there's a great Double. need. Yeah, there's a great need for community, community involvement and for community inclusion into these processes because contexts are different from different places. So you need to understand what is happening in this context in order to come up with what you are. So I totally go for community in involvement. Pradeep? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you one example. Before coming to here, there's a, in Nepal, after the earthquake reconstruction is happening hugely, and then I asked with the uh, Nepal government authority to ensure young people participation in this process, and they are not listening our voice. And then I went to Asian Development Bank, and they are funding for, uh, for many, many parts of the country, and then I went to them and then I asked with them, in, when you are doing agreement with the Nepal government, ensure youth participation in, in all the process. And then they asked with the Nepal government official to, in, to ensure young people participation in reconstruction. Now they are doing that. Sometimes when we ask for many things with the government, they are not listening us. But sometimes donors ask with them that they will listen. So we need to, we need to channel in different ways. So that, that's the, the, we need to ensure young people and marginalized people uh, in, in the, this is a making process, but sometimes we, we ask all the time, but they are not listening. We need to channelize in different ways. Have external yeah. support. Support, in that. yeah. Claire. So I think, I, I think and hope this is what the report will do, but I think it's that US leadership on this issue really matters. And, and now's the time for a sort of renewed, bold vision that you know, Sarah's report at the World Bank did to really mobilize people. I think understandably in the US, especially the media and the public and some policymakers, there's a lot of lack of confidence. You know, Iraq and Afghanistan were tough experiences and this has really demoralized people. But now's the time to also look for grounds for confidence. And I think US leadership, whether it's in Colombia of the last decade, 
South Korea, all around the world, that when the US has put its resources and leadership in partnership and through multilateral institutions with others, um, it, it matters and, and try to find a way to, to mobilize this US public and policy establishment to, for the next decade. Sarah. I agree with that and with the previous speakers. I would just add that I think if you were able to work out what is common and what is different between our discussions on violence prevention, on conflict prevention, on prevention of violent extremism, um, and on prevention of mass atrocities. Those are four different communities that use the word prevention, but that actually don't cross over very much. That would not only be useful here, it would be very useful to other countries who are grappling with that. So challenge. create a typology in terms of the kind of Work out what's effort. common about those challenges and what is <clears throat> actually different and requires quite distinct responses. And where can responses contradict? between the different communities. Which is, has happened. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> um, I want to open it up and um, enable uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, we have mics. Um, if, if we can come down front, we have a questioner right here, sir. And please, uh, if you could just tell us who you are when you ask your question. Yeah, right down here. Somebody has to be first, I suppose. We um, appreciate it. My name is Peter Dixon, associated with an organization called Concordis International. Thank you all for your, for your comments and for your wisdom. Um, we talk about fragile and conflict-affected states as a, as a kind of acronym, and, and we talk about states, and, and sometimes we, we see them as pariah states. Um, but it's very state-based. We live in a, an international society which is a system which is, uh, has the sort of inadequate shorthand of the Westphalian system, um, very state-based. Um, and um, Fixing Failed States is a, is a, uh, a concept, um, a book, and all about states. But we, uh, to, uh, the professor next to me might well suggest that the state is a very open system, not a closed system. Um, and uh, I just wonder what you might have to say about fragility as an international concept rather than fragile states as such. Uh, how do globalization, for instance, and fragmentation um, affect the, the fragility? Thank you. Anybody want to tackle that, Eileen? Uh, to, <clears throat> just to say that another part of our project, uh, not on basic services, but on security sector and, and reform of the security sector, is a, a project done by our colleague Alex Duall in looking at peace missions in Africa and how they create or don't create senses of security. And one of the things that, that they've found in that research is that, um, not surprisingly, the, the conflicts that are uh, uh, nominally state conflicts within states are not at all. That they're more regional, that there is cross, a lot of cross-border um, relationships and things that pass back and forth. They're, the parties are much more multivariate and that these processes need to be seen as regional problems rather than state-based problems. Again, it means reconceptualizing who is at the table and table metaphorically, uh, who's included when we talk about inclusion, it may be that you have to bring in a larger group of people that, rather than just the state people themselves, because the, uh, uh, not just interested actors, but the important actors in making decisions and changing political processes are larger than within the state, so. Sarah. I think it's important when we talk about institutions to think about whether our international institutions are geared to actually prevent and redress these newer types of conflict. So if you think about the Security Council now, the Security Council is not a capable and inclusive and accountable institution in its current form. Or necessarily so, effective. Indeed, yeah. No, so capable, definitely. Yeah, okay. I, I think the results yes. uh, in the last few years speak for themselves to some extent. But so the institutional arguments at national level, you can mirror at regional or at, at international level. 
Now, that's not going to change realistically in the next few years. So one needs to think of ways to work around that, what mechanisms can be set to create more inclusion, to create pressure for some accountability on results. Um, let's take a few questions. Uh, sir, right here. Hi. I'm, uh, hello? You're, you're on. Sorry. Uh, William Anderson, former USA Senior Foreign Service Officer, uh, Senior Development Advisor at U.S. European Command and African Command, and a formerly USA representative to the European Union. So the WDR, the World Development Report of 2011, which I thought was a wonderful piece, concluded in, in brief that to prevent recurring violence in conflict-affected states, you need citizen security, jobs, and legitimate institutions, uh, and it takes a generation. So how do we get stakeholders, national and international, especially governments and donors in the U.S., whose horizons are barely a day to act, plan, act, and adapt accordingly. Good question. Uh, over here in the white shirt. Yep. And one other, we want to tee up. Raise your hand if you have one. Go ahead, sir. Andrew Tomlinson from the Quaker UN office in, uh, in New York. And thank you for a wonderful panel. Um, so we talked a lot about inclusion this morning. And of course, inclusion comes up very strongly in the 2030 agenda. Um, and I would emphasize that we're not just talking about goal 16, but goal 10 and other places. And actually, some of the inclusion language is probably more transformative longer term than everything we have in goal 16. Um, but the question that arises, I think, as we focus more on inclusion is, can we switch our thinking from inclusion as part of a sort of a democratization project and eventually a, re a regime change project to thinking about how we actually encourage more repressive political circumstances to actually work on inclusion in those, not, in, not as, as a road to some kind of big scale political change, but how do we actually, if you like, sell this in, in the less than democratic circumstances in which most of the world lives? What does actually inclusion look like in, in a less than democratic political environment. And I think, so I'm really interested in how the panel could think about this and perhaps help us what is really the key issue in implementing the inclusion project in so many countries around the world. Thank you. The ad campaign for inclusion. <clears throat> uh, what, final question down here of this round. D uh, the woman in the left, did, did you have a question? No? Okay. Uh, over here. Hi, my name is Sophia Giddens, and I'm with the Global Nomads Group. And my question is on your experiences, or if you could cite examples of best practices of youth in civic engagement, either training or within the actual political process. Thank you. Uh, OK, so um, let, Pradeep, do you want to start with the youth question? Yeah. Uh, we, we are running the campaign against the corruption. I'll, I'll give example. Uh, corruption, uh, if we talk about the corruption, it, it starts from the house. Usually I talk with the young people, have you ever asked with the, your parents how much money they are earning? Or how much money they earn? Look, let, let's give an example. In young people, they want a motorbike. Uh, but their parents earn like every month like hundred dollars, but young people wants a uh, hundred thousand dollars motorbike. So how your parents can give you motorbike, but you are asking with your parents motorbike or iPhone. So it's corruption start from home. You are encouraging your parents to give something what your parents doesn't have. So that's a start from house. So we ask with the young people, so please ask if your father giving motorbike or iPhone, ask with the, your parents first start from the house. And then ask question to your government or wherever. Asking question is one of our campaign. 
ask how it's not happening or how it's happened. So from the house. So asking question is our one of the campaign. That's it's a really good campaign. So when we talk about this and then young people realize, oh, I'm part of the corruption, corrupt society. And then when we ask with the family and then the family is aware, oh, my, my son or daughter asking these questions, if, if that really happened, so I'm going to jail or somewhere else. So we are the uh, country like 16th in the uh, more than 167 countries uh, Transparency International does uh, survey and we're on the 16 list. So now we are educating young people to ask the questions on these issues. Uh, I just wanna not really answer, but uh, democracy and inclusion, uh, that's questions all but I wanna answer. Now we have like more than 16 years we don't have a local election. Every year more than 100,000 uh, young people can participate in, in the election uh, process, in the one time election. Now three terms we don't have election. So more than 500,000 young people couldn't get chance to involve in the democratic process. Hmm. So that means they can't <coughs> involve in the decision making process. When they can't involve in the decision making process, inclusion is not happening. Even though we have a democracy, we are a federal democratic republic country, but we don't have a local election from 16 years. So that kind of situation is happening. Inclusion is like buzzword. No one want to do really in, 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 in a, in a, in a uh, real, real situation. Look at this, I saw the, some of the picture of the, our leaders. When they were demanding the democracy, and then they were like, we include you, you, you all, when we have a democracy registration. But after that, they forget all of them. And the next election, they are going, going to happen very soon, and they are also giving same agenda, we are include you. So it's not happening. When you are in the position to giving position, you are very, very, very reluctant, and you don't want to give. So you third, uh, this leader third, this is our like own assets or something like that. So we need to challenge, especially young people need to challenge the authority, challenge our family. We need to ask the question. You have a little bit more culture in US and uh, this part of the world asking a question, but we don't have a culture of asking questions to our authority or our own family. So that's why we have this kind of campaign asking questions to our authority. So, so it, that's a good segue. Other thoughts uh, on how you convince uh, particularly more authoritarian or closed societies to, to take on an inclusive approach? Claire? Um, I think it's a great question. So one of course is inclusion in the political processes, but what are the other avenues for participation? And one of them is the functional, which Eileen has already mentioned. So the co-creation and the participation in service delivery, whether it's the health system and the way that health services are delivered, the education system, agriculture, and there's been a lot of tremendous learning and expansion of the community-driven development approach, whether at the village level, um, people take responsibility and make their own decisions on the allocation of resources. Um, we're seeing, I mean, I think the other is when we look at the different levels of governance and where are the avenues for participation, and particularly given the pace of urbanization and the role of cities, participation, <coughs> whether it's through the election of mayors, election of city councils, um, is going to be just, is, is already a tremendously important avenue and will continue to be. I mean, some of the great examples that I've seen as, as we've launched this, this new process is, um, you know, getting, and I understand it in Nepal because you've had the delay of local elections, it hasn't been possible, but for example, in Kenya, terrific work being to help young people stand for election um, at all levels of governance, and this new way, this new generation are now having both political and technical representation in this way. And how do we then keep people engaged if it's generational? Um, how, do we, how do we keep, we're, we're pulling out uh, just before your next elections in Liberia. What, Sarah, you, yeah. you're the one who made the statement. How do we, how do we address that? So that, that piece of research that you quoted basically looked at every country that had made a transition in the 20th century and how long it took them to go from the institutional level of Haiti to the level of roughly Ghana. And it found it was on average 20 years. So our three year time frames or five year time frames are, are way off. That was the most unpopular recommendation we had in Washington, I must mm. say. 
So clearly this is not <laughs> easy to, to change. I am a little bit hopeful because it's come up through an unanticipated angle recently on the humanitarian side, where one of the major mm -hmm. themes in Istanbul was when the average person is now displaced for 17 years, how can we keep having these annual funding appeals? We need multi-year programs. So I'm hoping that will be a bit of additional pressure. But in the end, as I'm sure everyone here knows, that's a political <coughs> challenge within donor countries to get agreement to make the, the changes. And donor countries have legislative and policy constraints to doing it. Just on Andrew's question, 20 seconds, I think we also need to do a better job of publicizing the experiences of countries that have gone from authoritarian governments to more inclusive systems without a war in between. And two of those experiences would be Indonesia, I think very relevant, for instance, for different countries in the Middle East now, and Ghana in your neighborhood, which, while by no means perfect on every front, avoided a major civil war in the transition that it, it went through. And Tunisia is now and Tunisia is providing, providing another model. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Gonna, could I just yes. one other comment sure. I, about the question about the, the incentives and the uh, especially U.S. agencies that have this short time frame and have to see results. Um, if there's anything that in your report on advice to the next administration, whoever that might be, um, if, if, if we could finally get around to changing the incentive structure for uh, aid assistance and where people's careers and promotions are not based on outputs, but are p based on the processes that they put in place mm. to do the kinds of things we're talking about. If we know that this is what is needed, why aren't those the parameters on which people are given incentives to perform? Putting processes in place and, and having them be politically sensitive and based on good analysis, why aren't those the parameters rather than how many dams do you build, how many clinics do you set up, and the boxes that you check? We have to change the incentives in the institutions. Thank you. Um, I'm being told we only have two minutes left. I will take one final question and then give everybody a chance to wrap up. Uh, all the way in the back, gentleman with the beard. Aaron Chassie, Catholic Relief Services. Thank you all for uh, talking about inclusion and challenges and trying to increase it. Could you now shift a bit and talk more about access and influence um, and how civil society beyond just the community level can be a very active voice in channeling citizens' concerns and uh, their preferences at higher levels? Uh, and, and, and more importantly, connecting those different levels so it's not just the community or just working at the national level for socio-political change, but setting up the process, as Eileen said, to actually be able to work at all levels. Grace, that might have your name on it. Okay, thank you. Well, in as much as we want to do all of the work at the community level, it will not be very essential if we don't link it to the national level, neither to the international levels. So everything we do at the local level must be transformed, must be sent to the national level. And the way we do that is that we try to engage different stakeholders based on the kind of situations we are working on. For example, if you are doing a peaceful elections project and you are doing the, the peace building initiative at the community level, the best thing to do is to engage different stakeholders that are in the sector. For example, the elections commissions, the Liberian National Police, the transport ministry, the, all of the security sectors. You need to get them involved because this is a situation that they actually supposed to be involved. Since you are doing it, you need to get them linked so that they send it at the national level. And from the national level, our own government has to take it and send it to the international level. So there must be a link. I clearly agree that there is no way that we can survive at the community levels with all of the good things we are doing if it is not linked at the international levels. So the processes are in place. We do that by connecting different stakeholders based on the, the issues we are working on. Thank you. So I'm just gonna do a check. Find, are there, is there anything that 
absolutely wasn't said that we would be remiss in leaving out. Final I, I comments? Just, <laughs> I just want to say last thing. There's a uh, huge international community here. Uh, when you travel to like our country and then you meet the certain kind of people, that means elite, that means who has access of information, who has like network. So you got one kind of impression only. So that most of the time our project and our campaign failure because of the you have, you can't get chance to meet the, those group of people who never heard. So let's try to meet other kind of people, those who can give you different perspective that would be lead to uh, our campaign or our programs uh, in different way. And then change will happen slowly, but uh, we, uh, we are, we want to change very fast because young people want to change very fast. <laughs> and we don't want to wait change until we die. So we want to, in this generation, we want to change in this generation. So let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. <laughs> Claire. Claire, you wanted to add something. Just, just one thought, and I think, you know, what is it that the US peace building can contribute to the peace building, state building field, especially as we now mobilize around goal 16? Um, one of the things we didn't touch <coughs> on here, but I think it's worth mentioning, is what the science and technology community can bring to the field, the vast innovation um, that America brings. Um, and whether that's, you know, as Yemen hopefully moves towards a peace process, solving the water issue in Yemen yeah. um, and bringing this agenda back into the peace building <coughs> field um, as we look to the decade ahead, I think will be very important to do. Great, thank you. I w please join me in thanking our panel for the research, the energy. We, we appreciate the knowledge, the experience, and the impatience. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.